the biggest thing that you need to shift in your mind is that you have a story to tell. I think everybody has a story to tell. I think everybody has a unique perspective and they have a unique way that they did things. So what got you to this point? What did you do? What was new in your career that made things interesting? What was the obstacles that you had to overcome and how did you do it? Welcome to the Product People Podcast, where we learn from amazing product leaders about product management, growth, and product talks. Today's guest is Jeff Gottlieb, author of a few books, including Lean UX and Forever Employable. We cover everything product in this special episode recorded by Stefan Dorking. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining another Product People podcast episode. My name is Stefan Dorflin. I'm a senior product manager at Product People, and I'll be your host for this episode. Today, we are joined by Jeff Gotthelf, who's an author, speaker, trainer, and board advisor, helping organizations build better products and helping executives build a culture that build better products. Thanks for joining us today, Jeff. Thanks for your time. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome, Jeff. So, Jeff, I'm going to jump right into our conversation and start us with getting a little insight into the journey that led you to where you are today. So, we know you've been a user experience manager at WebTrends, a director of user experience at theladders.com, and an author of Lean UX for Every Employable, Sense and Respond, and recently, Who Does What by How Much. So, Jeff, can you walk us through how you began your journey in product management and what initially drew you to this field? So I, st I started my career in information architecture, which is hopefully a, a trade that will be resuscitated a, a bit and UX design and interaction design. And then I just kind of found myself, you know, there tends to be overlap in UX design work and product management work. They're not concentric circles in a Venn diagram, right? But there is overlap in the work. And I found that at least for me personally, with the work that I was doing, the overlap was significant. And so it was a natural transition to move more into the product management side of things. I found myself doing more of that work, the, the more experience that I got. And then ultimately when we began launching our own businesses, that was the role that we all had to play was product manager because that was what was needed mm -hmm. in all startups. So that's how I got into it. And then since then, I've been not only doing the work, but working with others, doing the work, training, coaching, consulting, et cetera, with product managers. So it's been a, a significant amount of time in the space. And how did you decide to then become an author as well and start writing all these books? The interesting thing is that I never had any plans to do that, right? There was no, it wasn't like I set out to be an author originally, but what happened was when I was working at the ladders as director of user experience, we were dealing with trying to figure out how to do great design work in an organization that was transitioning to agile software development. So this was the mid to late 2000s, so roughly to 2012. So we're talking about you know, 12 to 16 years ago now, it's a long time, and we couldn't figure it out. And so we asked around and nobody had a good answer, really. Some folks had tried some things and they didn't work out so well. And so we worked internally. We worked with some other folks who were struggling with the same thing. And over the course of a couple of years, we came up with a solution to design at Agile. And I started speaking and writing about it, called it Lean UX. And that's when I got approached by O'Reilly because book publishers go to conferences and they look for the latest topics, the latest speakers, what's happening right now. And they offer book contracts to, to speakers who seem to be the authority on a particular subject. And I had been speaking about Lean UX for a while. They approached me. They offered me a book deal. I accepted. I had no idea what I was doing, but why not? Writing a book sounds amazing. Or at least having written a book sounds amazing. Writing a book is really hard work, not particularly amazing. And look, Lean UX, it took a long time to get out and I couldn't do it without the help of Josh Seiden. Josh Seiden joined me on the project in the last few months of it. And, and with him, we've brought that book to life and have done it now in two more editions. What's interesting is that book did well. That book for a niche book, right, by four designers, by designers in a technical construct context, that book did really well. And it changed what I do for a living. People started asking me to teach the material that's in the book. And that was really interesting. And so as we were developing that business and that work and that content, I realized there were other conversations to be had. And having now written a book and now having had Lean UX sort of a couple of years in the rear view mirror, the pain of writing it was not nearly as obvious, I guess, at that point. So uh, I was like, yeah, we'll write another book. And that's how kind of I got started with it and I've continued with it ever since. So you can almost quite literally say that becoming an author is something that found you. You didn't go and 
find it actually. That's correct. I, I literally wasn't looking for it. I, you know, to me, I'd written 500 word blog posts, a thousand words, right? But when, when, you know, when you get the book contract, there is a minimum word count. And, you know, 50,000 words sounds like Mount Everest. You know, like I'm just yeah. going to climb that mountain. But it's, it's surmountable, just like Mount Everest. Awesome, Jim. Thank you. We want to talk to you today about two of your books. So the first one is Forever Employable. And the second one is that's upcoming. It's Who Does What by How Much. So first, if you talk about Forever Employable, would you like to give our listeners a 90 second intro to what Forever Employable is about? Just some context about the book. Absolutely. So Forever Employable is that story. It's the story of how I built this content and thought leadership business. And the idea behind the book was the target reader persona for the book is a friend of mine. That's who I envisioned. And my friend is smart. He's talented. He's got all the tools to be successful in his career. Every three or four years or so, something happens in his career. There's a layoff, there's a merger, there's an acquisition, there's a shift in the market or in the tech landscape, and he panics. And he's got to get his CV together, and he's got to go job hunting, and he's, it's a crazy time, and it's really stressful. And I really wanted to provide him or the reader persona that developed out of him with a guide based on my experience for building a personal brand and a thought leadership business that positions you as a recognized expert in a specific field. So that, like you said a few minutes ago, opportunities find you rather than you having to chase them, right? So I never set out looking for a book deal, but a book deal found me, right? How do you build that kind of opportunity magnet? That's what the book is about. And to be perfectly honest, it's about my experience doing so and examples of other folks who have done it as well. So sharing sort of other folks from other industries, not just tech, who have done this as well. And it's a short book and it's very practical. It's very tactical. It's almost a recipe that you can follow and bet that it took me a long time to get to that point. I bet you could do it a lot faster than me these days. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. So you just mentioned now about transitioning from actively seeking jobs to having jobs find you. And you also mentioned that in your book as well. So what fundamental shifts in your mindset or approach do you need to undergo to achieve this state of perpetual um, employability? The, the biggest thing that you need to shift in your mind is that you have a story to tell. You have a valuable story to tell. So often, the reaction that people have when we talk about building a personal brand or building a thought leadership business is, I don't have a story to tell. What I have to say isn't interesting. It's all been done before. It's all been said before. That's the immediate reaction from everybody. I don't feel like doing it. It's work, right? I don't feel like doing it. I don't think people will be interested in my story. And to me, that's it's really sad. I think everybody has a story to tell. I think everybody has a unique perspective and they have a unique way that they did things. So what got you to this point? What did you do? What was new in your career that made things interesting? What was the obstacles that you had to overcome and how did you do it? Those to me are important stories. And I think the more that people share and the more generously they share, the better their storytelling becomes and people start to get really engaged in it. So the, the more you can tell your story and be honest and authentic about it, the better it gets. But people are really shy and, and scared about doing that. And, and you've also mentioned like personal branding now as well. So I want to move into that as well. So you, personal branding plays a significant role in your concept of forever employable in your book as well. So can you elaborate on the key principles or strategies individuals should embrace to build a compelling personal brand in today's you know competitive landscape? So I, I think most importantly is you need what we call in the book is to plant a flag, right? To plant a flag, which means to to decide what you're going to be known for. What will people, what expertise will people recognize you for? And that's a really interesting challenge for a lot of folks because it can absolutely be something professional, right? I'm an excellent designer. I'm really great at building prototypes. I'm the master of interviewing customers, you know, whatever it is. It could be something personal as well, right? You might decide, you know what? I'm really going to build my personal brand on cake making, right? I love baking cakes. I'm really good at it. My cakes are gorgeous. I'm going to build my brand on that. So really choosing the thing, I think, is tough, but it's really the fundamental principle because ultimately what I want, like for, for example, me, for better or for worse, right? To this day, I'm the lean UX guy. 
right? That's where I planted my first flag. I'm trying to plant a couple more flags now, and I have for a few years, right? But generally speaking, I'm the, like, if you ask people, what's, do you know Jeff Gottoff? Oh yeah, he wrote Lean UX, right? That's where I planted my flag, and that's where I doubled down, and that's where I decided I want to be known for, because when people have problems integrating design, user experience, product management, and agile software development, I want them to think of me. Right? That's my recognized expertise. I can help you solve that problem, among other problems as well. And so really identifying where you want to plant that flag is super important. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a mind shift for me, at least, when you answer it now as well, that it doesn't always have to be, I'm the UX guy. You know, It could be something different, something a little bit more personal to who you are. I, I think that's a little bit lost on people sometimes when they think about this world. You were talking previously about this frame that you were writing for as well. And you mentioned some stuff around like restructuring, layoffs, all of these things that are happening. And the business landscape does evolve, right? Those types of things do happen. So how can people, you know, future-proof like, their careers and, you know, ensure that they remain indispensable despite all of these changes and all of these things that evolve in the business landscape? There's a quote we I use in a book, and it's important. It's a Jeff Bezos quote where he talks about the problems that he's solving or that he solved certainly with Amazon. We'll just talk about Amazon for now. The problems that he's solved with Amazon are problems that people are always going to have. I need access to a variety of goods. I need a variety. I need access to low cost products. I need easy, fast delivery. I need you know, I need, you know, to be entertained or to read books or whatever it is, right? Those are problems that people are always going to have. How you solve those problems is going to evolve over time. That's up to you. That's for you to stay current and relevant and, and on top of changing trends and technologies and sort of consumption patterns. The core fundamental problem that you're solving should be evergreen. And I think that's important to think about that. If you're going to build this forever employable platform, what are some evergreen problems that you are going to help solve? Today, it's design and agile, right? Tomorrow, it's, you know, AI and whatever, right? But the fundamental problem that I'm solving is customer centricity and cross-functional collaboration along with organizational agility. Like those are things that are always going to be an issue for organizations. How do we keep an eye on the customer, right? Every time there's a new shiny object, we got, you know, right now, AI. Put AI in the product. Why, right? Like, have that conversation to me. And, and, and look, and that was, a bit, it was a bit before AI, it was machine learning. And before machine learning, it was uh, chatbots. And before chatbots, it was whatever, right? And so the symptoms change, but the root problems are always the same. And so to me, that's what you have to figure out. Like, what is the root problem that folks are struggling with? Right? No, no matter what changes, and that's where you base your foundation. Thanks, Jeff. That's such great advice. I feel like you're actually talking to me here. It's really <laughs> great. And then we have a new book coming out as well. It's called Who Does What by How Much. And I'd like us to spend a little bit of time talking about that book. So if you could give an elevator pitch for Who Does What by How Much and what the story is behind it, could you share what that would be with us? Yeah. So Who Does What by How Much is a book about objectives and key results. It's a practical guide to customer-centric OKRs. And it's designed to be the book that your company buys for every employee at the company, right? So everybody will get a copy of this book because everybody's implementing OKRs. And this is the book that clearly and plainly spells out what are OKRs, why should we do them, how do they work, what should we be looking for once we've got them set, and how do we implement them in a way that actually makes us a more successful organization as a whole. That's what the book is about. The book really is based on two fundamental principles. The first principle is that everybody has a customer. What we mean by that is that no matter who you build products for, you have a customer. So if you're in a B2C e-commerce situation, it's obvious who your customer is. It's the end consumer. But if you build procurement systems, your customer is the vendor who has to onboard into your company if you maintain the, the procurement system. If you build APIs, your customer is a developer or another development team, right? So understanding that there are humans at the end of the value chain consuming the thing that you make is fundamental to setting the right goals. How do we know that we've delivered value to the customer when everybody has a customer, right? Who's the customer for marketing, like the internal customer? Who's the customer for finance or HR or legal? Right? I was talking to a learning and development guy at, at a big company yesterday, and he totally got it. He said, look, my customers are the staff and the leadership team, and my goal is to make them successful. And so that's, that's the first 
aspect of the book. The second aspect of the book is that your key results have to be outcomes. They have to be measures of human behavior. That's key. The measure of value is, did we positively impact the behavior of the people that we serve, of our customers? So if I'm building systems, development systems for talent, development systems for staff inside my company, how do I know I chose the right system? How do I know I built the right content? Two big theses in the book itself. Hey, if you're enjoying this Product People podcast, check out our weekly live streams on LinkedIn and YouTube. Back to the episode. Thank you, Jeff. And what's the story behind this? Like, how did you decide this is the next book that I'm going to write? That's an excellent question. The, the books that we've been writing, Josh Side and I have been writing for the last 12, 13 years, have started from the very practical, I mean, the very tactical to slightly more strategic to slightly more strategic. And so I feel like we've been backing our way out in elevation with the books that we've been writing. And, you know, if Lean UX was a very tactical book for product development teams, Sense and Respond was a book for their leaders to talk about how to support and create a culture that supports those teams. And who does what by how much is now designed to basically say, if we can set the right goals for the organization and we can align the organization around human-centric goals, then all the other things, agility, customer centricity, cross-functional collaboration, design, research, product management, product discovery, et cetera, all those things are happen more easily, right? And we build better products and we become more successful. So that's how we ended up at this. Like we kept backing our way up against this. That people would be like, I'd love to work in a lean UX way. I'd love to be more agile, but my incentive is to ship a product. My incentive is to do something. And so we kept bumping up against this layer that we couldn't get past no matter what we did. And so we decided to take on that layer. And that layer is goal setting and goal setting needs to change to human centric goal setting. And OKRs is the way to do it. And I think in general, OKRs have gained, you know, significant attention in, in the recent years. But what I've seen personally as well is that many, many companies still struggle to implement them effectively. And I know you've touched on this a little bit, but what are those main challenges or those biggest challenges that you've seen organizations face when they have to adopt these OKRs? Yeah. I mean, look, the, hard, the hardest part is moving from outputs to outcomes. I know it's cliche. Yeah. I know I know it sounds familiar, but it's the hardest part because look, we're working against a tsunami of historical inertia, right? We're working against a hundred years, at least, of industrial manufacturing driven management philosophy, right? All of like, it's changing now, but the overwhelming majority of management philosophy comes from manufacturing because that's where management came from, right? And all of that management philosophy was focused on improving the production of goods, making it more efficient, less expensive, right? More profitable, squeezing productivity out of people, you know, organizing better, that type of thing. And all of that was focused on the production of a thing, right? Did you make the thing? And if you did, then that was success. Right. In a digitally driven world, in a software driven business world, which is how we live today, right? The production of software does not necessarily equal value. It just means that you made some software. And the production of more software does not necessarily mean that you've delivered more value. In fact, I would argue that you need to produce the least amount of software possible that generates the most amount of value because, you, because our, the systems that we build today are infinite, they're continuous, or we have to support these systems forever, right? Every feature you put out into the world, you now have to maintain forever until you sunset it. And I'd like to hear about the last time you sunset a feature. That doesn't happen, right? Not very often anyway. And so the fundamental shift here is to get folks out of this mindset that making more stuff will make us more successful and to get them into the mindset that says, what do people need to do in our systems? What are they doing today? What's getting in their way? And if we make them more successful, what will they be doing differently? Who does what by how much, right? That's the definition of success. Who's the customer? What do we want them to do? By how much more or by how much less, right? And here's where this gets interesting. This is the, the most difficult part of this whole thing. In that world where we shift from outputs to outcomes, product becomes the variable, right? Like usually the product is not a variable, right? If you have any work experience at all, you're familiar with the phrase requirements document, right? If there's any variability in a requirements document, right? Required. It's in the name of the document. And that's how we typically work in an output-focused world, right? In an outcome-focused world, 
product is a hypothesis. It's our best guess about how we can get people to change their behavior. And if through the process of research, design, discovery, experimentation, iteration, continuous learning, et cetera, we learn that the thing that we're working on isn't going to make our customers more successful, we have the obligation and the responsibility to change course. And, and changing course based on evidence, which is what we're doing, is agile, right? That is organizational agility. But organizations struggle with this because the whole system is built around producing output, including incentives and performance management criteria. And so this is the big onion. Like to, when you start to peel back the layers, it gets really messy, right? To me, that's the biggest obstacle. If we can get organizations to believe that outcomes are the right measures of success, we get through 50% of the issues. The rest is details and implementation. And I, I don't mean to gloss over it as insignificant, right? But that's the big one. That's the starting point. You can't go yeah. running without running shoes, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it's the problem. There's another issue here, right? The, the other issue here is that we've taught our leaders in universities and MBA programs through other managers that it's their job to tell people what to do, right? Make me an app. Make sure it's got these three buttons in it and make sure they're red, white, and blue. And you're like, okay, boss, but like, how do we know that that's going to get people to buy more furniture online? Well, that's what I think you should do because I'm the boss, right? We've got to get people out of that mindset. And the mindset being, look, strategically, team, we need to expand our online furniture sales into North America, okay? And currently, here's what we know about the North American market. Here are some of the challenges, right? So I'd like you to solve this challenge. I'd like you to solve that challenge and you to solve that challenge. And our measures of success are behavior changes in the customers, right? To me, that is a modern leader. That's modern leadership, but that's not how leadership works today because that requires, and you can see the onions, right? The layers I'm peeling away here. There's a million things here all of a sudden, right? It requires humility, right? And leadership and humility are often not found together in the same room. When actually they should be most of the time. But, but Jeff, that's a great answer. The one word that I feel you keep mentioning like throughout, which makes sense because it's also like one of the key themes in your book as well is customers. You know, you kept mentioning how we should be focused on them and putting customers at the center of the business strategy is like a key theme in your book descriptions as well. And how do you see OKRs facilitating this customer-centric approach and what role do they play in driving customer-focused outcomes? So it's in the title of the book, right? And to me, that's the reason why we named the book Who Does What by How Much is because this is how we teach it, right? And it's, it's that first word, who. I want you to think about who. And, and look, again, B2C, retail, commerce, easy peasy, right? You know, we sell video games to teenagers. Okay, who? It's teenagers, right? Easy, easy, right? It gets interesting in, in B2B and B2B2C, right? And I work in that space a lot. So when, when you, talk to, you talk to a financial services company, for example, and you say, who's your customer? And they'll say, it's another bank. That's who the customer is. It's like, no, no, that, a bank isn't a who. A bank is, is an entity. Who inside the bank consumes the thing that you make? Oh, it's the marketing manager. Great. And if the marketing manager gets value from what you're making for them, what will they be doing differently? So the customer-centric aspect of this is to always bring it back to who. Who does what by how much? When people say, we'll increase engagement, that's my favorite, right? It's, it's probably the most vague statement in product management, right? Or in product development. We'll increase engagement. Okay, let's, let's pick that apart. Whose engagement will we increase? Well, it'll be the marketing manager, but they're not the buyer. So it's going to be the, the chief marketing officer as well. Okay, great. We've got two personas. Okay, great. What does engagement mean? Like when the marketing manager is engaged, what are they doing differently? Oh, well, they're signing into the product on a daily basis and they're creating at least three campaigns a week. Oh, okay. Who does what by how much? We're back to it, right? You're always like, you have to pick it apart and come back to that question. And if you can answer that question, right? If the goal that you're setting, the conversation that you're having can answer the question, ultimately, who does what by how much, then you've written at least a decent OKR. Is it the right OKR? Is it the right goal? Is it the right behavior? Different conversation. That's the next conversation. But at the very least, let's get away from build the campaign tracking system to reduce the number of complaints by marketing managers that they don't know what's going on with their campaigns. That's actually trying to change. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I think, that, like you said, you actually want this book to be something that everyone in the organizations have to read. We have a book club and product people as well. We, we Every month we read a different book and we present to each other. And I think this is 
definitely one of those where I think we could all find so much value from as well and to kind of share it with each other. But thank you for all your great answers on this book on who does what by how much. I'm kind of a little bit curious. I'm going to just ask it looking into the future. Are there any plans for another book that you'll add to the PM ecosystem? Is there a layer that you can go even higher to? Look, it's hard to say because we're not finished with this one yet, right? So it's hard to be like, oh, here's the next one. Maybe. I think the answer is maybe. You know, I think if I'm going to take on anything next, I'd love to take on strategy, but I don't know. I, I don't have a clue yet how to do it in a way that is original, right? Strategy is one of those things that's very, it's nebulous and there's infinite material on it and opinions and definitions. But if we go anywhere, I think that's the next level up and I'd love to take that on. I, I don't have a thesis yet on that. I've got ideas, no, nothing concrete. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so thankful to have gotten the opportunity to talk to you and for you to share all your insights with our listeners today. Thank you for joining us today. And I wish you all the best with your new book. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this Product People podcast. If you found it useful, please subscribe and consider giving us a rating. For more info, visit getproductpeople.com and see you next time.